topic for today is going to be fall of Rome. I don't want you to think about this as just the, a question of why did Rome fall. Part of the reason we examine this question in a world history sense is because it's an enduring question. And that enduring question is, why do societies decay? Why do they fall apart? Why do they become corrupt? Why do they do things that they didn't do when they were at their flourishing peaks? You can be more cognizant of your own society and other societies by examining this question and examining Rome. So I want to fit that in a, in a broader context for you. Um, so I want to start with some recap that I think is, is necessary framing to make sense of a lot of the problems we're going to visit in a moment here. And that is Julius Caesar, the second triumvirate, and Julius Caesar's nephew, the more, I guess, more famous, enduring Caesar, Caesar Augustus. So as Mrs. Foster talked about on Tuesday, Julius Caesar, himself, the actual time he ruled was extraordinarily brief. He was, by the time he came back to Rome and began enacting his policies and got off the battlefield, he only lived for about a year before he was stabbed to death by the Roman Senate. And then he's off the scene. And there's a brief period of kind of chaos uh, and, and disorder that's going to be brought back together under the Second Triumvirate. But Caesar's death, and even during his life, as accomplished as he was, he never really dealt with the deep problems that existed in the Roman system. So I just want to present three problems here briefly. The Roman system never fully dealt with the problem of what I call militarization of politics. By militarization of politics, we mean if your whole system is based on voting, and, and, and political structure like a Senate and assemblies and people ab uh, abiding by those rules and norms, if that stops and you begin settling things through military violence, then that is going to really spread uncertainty and disruption throughout your whole society. And what you're going to see in Rome is that a lot of times politicians are simultaneously generals who have legions of troops behind them. So there's always going to be a temptation that if push comes to shove, if this disagreement gets too intense, I'm going to take my legions and I'm going to go after the guy I hate most. And maybe he has legions and will settle it in one epic showdown battlefield, uh, but then I'll be in charge briefly until someone does the same to me. That's going to be a problem because it basically is a recipe for nonstop civil war. Uh, there's the cost of expansion. Rome grows in fabulously wealthy through its conquests of various parts of the Mediterranean world. The problem is you have to keep up those conquests. You take over Gaul, yes, you get some temporary wealth, but you have to maintain it with soldiers and outposts and military installations and tax collectors and all of those things that go into maintaining an empire that over time costs money. Economic inequality. Because some people get fabulously wealthy from Rome's conquests, that doesn't mean everybody does. There are a lot of parts of the empire that are squeezed for taxes, that don't have access to slaves or land to generate wealth. Those people are going to grow increasingly uh, a larger percentage of the population. And that's going to be a problem for Rome. So, Caesar, even though he was quite accomplished, never quite dealt with that. The second triumvirate is going to inherit all of those old problems. So what is the second triumvirate? I'll give you three people. The word triumvirate is Latin for rule of three men. Oftentimes, if there's social chaos, three powerful people will come together as a way of maintaining stability. The first of these individuals has a relationship to Caesar. He's his nephew. He's about your age at the time his uncle, Julius, is assassinated. He's a kind of child prodigy. He's a very smart young, young man. He's interested in launching a political career. And it just so happens that Caesar, in his will, decides to adopt young Octavian. He adopts him as his own son. Octavian will take on his uncle's surname, Caesar as well as get access to his wealth and his connections and some of the loyalties of his soldiers. So he's going to be an inspiring force uh, to, be, to be reckoned with. The other guy, probably the most formidable, and if you were a, a betting person on who's going to emerge from this, you'd probably select Mark Antony, the second member. He was Caesar's right-hand man. He was a general. He was an accomplished general. Um, he was a little bit of um, 
of an, of an uncertain quantity. He was known for kind of having an erratic temper. But he inherited most of, soldier, uh, most of the soldiers from Julius Caesar. The third guy, kind of a non-factor, Marcus Lepidus, had command of some, some legions, but wasn't much of a player. So with that, I want to stop here for a moment and show you. So um, Augustus, um, he's going to be the guy who eventually emerges from this. Augustus is going to be the one, the young one, uh, to, who really emerges from this. Uh, he's, uh, he wasn't called Augustus then. His name was Octavian. He'll change his name to Augustus later on, which means divine or, or revered one. Uh, he's going to defeat Antony in kind of a decisive battle. He doesn't just defeat Antony. Antony, when he goes to Egypt to govern Egypt, as they discussed in the, in the, in the clip, is going to align himself and actually marry the Egyptian queen Cleopatra. So he's going to have the benefit of Egypt's wealth at his disposal. Uh, but young Octavian is going to defeat him Anyway, and Octavian emerges out of all this. Lepidus, by the way, is going to get pushed aside. He's this kind of a non-factor. Um, he consolidates the Roman Empire. It, was, it would be as though as if Julius Caesar was never assassinated. That's kind of what Augustus sets out to do. Um, he goes about keeping the facade of the Roman Senate. Uh, he keeps it in place so Rome could still nominally be called a republic. There are still senators. They show up in a place. But it's behind the scenes where the power is, and that's where Caesar Augustus is going to be his most powerful. He's going to implement a vast, vast network of patronage. This is a term you should be familiar with. Patronage, uh, I think we, we talked about it earlier. Um, it's a system where you basically take on clients uh, beneath you socially and economically. Um, you give them money. Uh, or you give them protection, and in return, they do stuff for you. And if you're wealthy enough, like Octavian Caesar Augustus, you can control most elements of the government through this. Uh, he also will maintain control, or at least a grip, on a standing army, so anytime a problem emerges, he can tamp down on it really simply. Uh, he's going to embark on a huge system of public works, just like his uncle Julius Caesar had started to do. Public works are really essential because it puts the common Roman and, and person living in the Roman Empire to work. It gives them a job. It gives them a paycheck. Um, he'll begin to redistribute land to veterans to kind of like pay them off for their services. And also he'll make land ownership a little bit more expansive for the average Italian. The thing he was probably most effective at is propaganda. News media that goes about trying to persuade people of stuff. And he's very good, and this goes back to his patronage, he's very good at paying writers and artists to say wonderful things about him and to control the news media uh, in the day, to make himself look like a noble figure. Uh, he also, quite simply, he outlives any of his rivals. The guy lives an increasingly long life. He lives into his 70s. And uh, in doing so, he pretty much is able to implement most of his system. The big flaw in Augustus's system is he doesn't provide any reliable mechanism for handing power over to the next person. So if you're a boy prodigy like Augustus, it all works. Highly competent person able to take care of everything in the empire. But what happens when someone less competent has to take over and they're not as effective at doing the job? Augustus doesn't really account for this. So the Roman Empire is kind of at risk the moment Augustus dies in that sense, as well as not fully dealing with old problems. Uh, the empire reaches its territorial peak in this map you kind of see here in the 200s, early 300s AD. So it has a, a couple good centuries. This is several centuries after the death of Augustus. Um, a lot of its real like stability happens in the 1st and 2nd century AD. Uh, but it's going to be under the Emperor Diocletian that it's at its territorial peak. I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but I love flowcharts. I think they frame our thinking uh, pretty well. Uh, at least it works for me. The Roman economic system is really kind of built on a cycle of violence uh, to, to keep the economic engine going. And that cycle begins, and you don't have to get this down, but if you want to, you can. Um, with the conquest of new territories, going back to, as Mrs. Foster talked about, the Punic Wars, where Rome starts expanding and conquering territory in the Mediterranean. 
that provides a lot of benefits. And I, I want to be honest about those benefits. It provides glory for the generals that do it. So there's a motivation for them to go out and conquer. Uh, new land for veterans. So if you're serving, you have a chance to move up in the world. Um, captured slaves for the economy. So when you take over Gaul or Germania or Hispania, you can send slaves back to Italy and enrich the people there, economically speaking. It's an influx of wealth overall. It's also new markets for traders and merchants to go out and have those outposts in Gaul and Britannia and Judea and wherever else. Lands get converted, however, into provinces. It's no longer a conquered, I mean, it's a conquered territory, but you're now running it as the Romans in charge. Uh, so you have to pay for administrators to show up. Governors, people who advise governors, people who monitor the amount of grain that goes to Judea and Egypt and Greece and so forth. And most importantly, very, very importantly, you have to collect taxes. Tax collection is what the Romans do. If you're a governor in the Roman Empire, guess what? Your job from sunup to sundown is making sure taxes get collected or else you have to answer to Caesar. Um, tax revenue goes back to Rome and Italy when the system is working and it's working smoothly. The people in Rome and Italy get fabulously wealthy. That's the benefits of empire. It's the wages of empire, so to speak. Um, the only thing that could throw this system off would be revolts or social disruption in the provinces um, because people who are conquered don't like to stay conquered. Uh, this is the whole backdrop to the Christian Bible um, in a lot of ways. Uh, Caesar Augustus calling for a census so taxes can be created uh, and, and various... Uh, groups within the Roman Empire threatening to revolt in fear of instability. That requires new troops, new legions, new military outposts, potentially bloody civil wars, costs upon the state. And you can only pay for new costs through conquering new territories. So it becomes this perpetual motion machine of violence and the need for violence. Um, so the decline begins. Rome kind of reaches its peak. I guess you could say in terms of when things really move smoothly at all levels would be during the emperors of Trajan and Hadrian. These are kind of looked back as the golden age of Rome, so to speak, in addition to Augustus. Um, there's an old saying um, that the Roman Senate used to bestow upon people, new emperors when they were sworn in or people as they were to embark upon a new phase in life. And, and I think when you say it in Latin, it, it kind of... Um, it, it crystallizes for you. Is This is what you'd say to a new emperor as a way of kind of wishing them well. But there's also kind of a sadness in it because you're realizing that maybe Rome wasn't what it was. In Latin, it goes something like this. Felicior Augusto Milor Triano, which means may he be luckier than Augustus and better than Trajan. So the Romans were very conscious of the fact that they had achieved a kind of a golden age, a level of prosperity under these emperors. Uh, and they looked back on it in, in, in that sense. Uh, the emperor Marcus Aurelius, an accomplished writer in his own right, as well as being an emperor, he's the last of what historians call the five good emperors. This is the backdrop to the movie Gladiator. How many people have seen the movie Gladiator? About the same as the last class. If you take away Mr. Ellenbecker, we've got like two people. Uh, it's kind of dated at this point. Um, so Marcus Aurelius dies in the first 15 minutes of that movie. Spoiler alert. Um, but the real drama is between his son Commodus and, uh, and the, the Roman general Maximus, played by Russell Crowe, and, and that's the whole new narrative that is kind of like wildly off base, historically speaking. But that's kind of the, the symbolic pivot from Rome being a prosperous, well-oiled society to going into decline. Commodus is going to be a poor leader. He's going to be actually killed by his own bodyguards, and it's going to be a time of disarray. His rule, as, the, as well as the rule of those who follow him, really sets off a streak of poor leadership. Leadership is one of those things that kind of trickle down throughout a society. Because it's not just the person in charge, it's not just the emperor, it's who the emperor appoints. And if those people aren't competent or are partially competent or have their own agendas, they're going to probably pass that dysfunction on to the next level of the bureaucracy. Uh, so there's going to be frequent fights for politic or for, uh, for, for power. There's going to be bloody civil wars. Uh, it's going to overall weaken the government. 
talented people are not going to want to serve in leadership roles because, frankly, they're afraid for their own life. If you work in the bureaucracy and your boss gets killed or the boss of your boss of your boss gets killed, guess what? There's a good chance that all the staff members down the line are at risk um, when the new guy comes to power and cleans house and puts in his own team. So there's a real fear of assassination, and that's going to be very difficult to administer a big, complicated bureaucracy like the Roman Empire. Economics. I think economics is, is at the core of this because economic problems are very contagious. They spread to many, many places. Uh, poor leadership, you can get around that. Maybe some people are competent, some people aren't. That person can't live forever. Economic problems tend to persist. Farmers are going to find that they can't keep land. Land ownership is going to be a constant problem for the Romans. Uh, so you're not going to have the ability to generate wealth, and a lot of people are going to be poor, and a handful of people are going to be wealthy. Uh, this term inflation uh, basically coins in the Roman system. Uh, money is going to lose its value. Mr. Ellenbecker, can you tell us a little bit about why inflation, what inflation is and why it's such a problem? And this is going to be visited upon Rome. A lot of times governors and, and political leaders are going to clip coins for the valuable currency. There's going to be kind of a psychology that if money's not valuable today, we better purchase every, or if money has value today, but it might not have value tomorrow, we better purchase everything we can now. And that creates panic and dysfunction within markets. Um, inflation's going to occur, rapid rise in prices. There's going to be a lot of black market or bartering to get around this. I don't trust the money. But I do trust, you know, uh, giving chickens in exchange for shoes or some other uh, form of exchange that doesn't require the exchange of actual currency. But if there's not that transaction of coins, you can't collect taxes. So there's less money going into the state, less potential revenue. And less money means less money for games, the military, and it's going to feed into these social problems. Taxes are going to have to be raised in order to offset the loss from inflation and black market activity. People are going to be less likely to attend school in this time. The state is not going to provide uh, public education as frequently or as, as consistently throughout the empire. Uh, large numbers of people are going to find themselves enslaved. This is kind of one of those byproducts of conquest. If you start taking over every part of the known world and selling populations into slavery, Guess what? The slave population is going to swell and eventually outnumber you, in some cases incredibly so. You know, if only one in ten people in a given community are free and they're surrounded by slaves, that's not exactly a recipe for stability. Uh, there's going to be plague by itself. No surprise, plagues will sweep in and out of the ancient world, as they will for centuries after. But when it happens at times where there's already problems, that will feed into them. Famine, again, it will happen throughout the ancient world. But when you have to deal with famine, inflation, and a civil war, and poor leadership, that's not exactly a good recipe either. Military problems. Many soldiers are only going to be serving in the Roman, ar uh, Roman army for money. It's a paycheck. It's not because of patriotism or some sort of devotion to the project of building an empire. So the Roman... Emperors and generals will hire mercenaries, people who are only in it for a paycheck. This is not a reliable fighting force always. Sometimes it is, a lot of times it's not. Uh, no money from taxes means you have less to pay a military. So you have to kind of degrade the quality of the soldier. And when soldiers do get paid, maybe they think they were owed more, and then they don't fight as hard, and you get problems from there. There's also a constant threat on the border regions, the frontiers, the areas where Rome uh, occupation ends and the barbarians or non-Romans, remember the Romans saw everyone who weren't Romans as barbarians, uh, where that stops. So the weak military that's impaired by these mercenaries and no taxes, that can't fend off people as it once did. The guy who tries to reform some of this is the emperor Diocletian right here. 
uh, when he becomes emperor, he, sit, he pretty much concludes that the only way to save the empire is to divide it in half. It's just too big, too much for one person to administer. So he creates an east and a west. He'll set price limits or price controls as a way of getting control on inflation. This is a tricky thing if you're a government official. Once you set price controls, you risk shortages, and it also um, uh, creates uh, uncertainty uh, in the marketplace. Um, it, it can disrupt commerce as well. And he'll try to enforce that by basically saying, if you don't abide, you die. Here's the emperor that is, that is in my top ten list, probably of most influential human beings in world history. Um, and it's not so much what he does uh, in the early part of his life as what he does towards the end of his life. So you don't have to worry about the top stuff so much. It's just kind of sequencing of how we get to him. The Roman Emperor Constantine, he succeeds Diocletian, and he also does a series of reforms. He actually ends a civil war. That's part of the way he comes to power. Uh, but he will continue that division between East and West. He'll actually move the Roman capital from Rome to a new city called Byzantium, which he's going to rename after himself and call it Constantinople. We know the city today as Istanbul which is going to be renamed by the Muslim Turks when they conquer it in the 15th century. But at the time, this was the new seat of the Roman Empire. Here's the big thing that puts Constantine in that influential world history list. He legalizes a minority sect religion within the Roman Empire. A tiny, it was actually started out as a tiny sliver in Judea. It would then spread to Greece and Asia Minor and eventually work its way back to Rome. But this tiny minority religion is Christianity. Christianity at the time is going to be seen as a little bit of an oddball religion, religious practice within the Roman Empire because the Romans themselves were not monotheists. They didn't believe in one God. They believed in many gods. They were polytheists. Remember, they imported the old Greek gods. So Constantine's going to legalize this. A number of Christians prior to this were were badly persecuted, and it was life was very miserable for Christians in Rome. But Constantine is going to alter that. He's going to set about uh, putting Christianity on, uh, on the track to increase. A lot of people within the Roman Empire are going to convert to Christianity because Constantine did. Um, he's going to create what's called the Council of Nicaea, uh, which is a gathering that he wants to kind of standardize Christian belief. That is a very difficult task because Christian belief is very diverse and there are many sects and variants and so forth. But the Council of Nicaea is going to be the attempt to do that. They're going to create the different books of the, or they're going to standardize the various books of the Bible and try to create what's called the canon. And it's really going to put Christianity on the path to being the dominant religion in all of the Western world. Anywhere that was once Rome, it's on the track to now being Christ, uh, Christian as a result because new leaders are going to enforce that the people beneath them are going to worship it, and so on. So, the, the end of Rome, the violent end of Rome, which is a more complicated story. The Western Empire, the part that isn't in the East, remember Diocletian and Constantine divided it, they're going to be unable to hold off the German tribes that were once conquered people, or partially conquered people, in the Roman world. Uh, the Romes will allow one group called the Visigoths to live within Roman boundaries but not being Roman citizens. And that's going to lead to a, a lot of tension and rebellion against Rome. One of these Visigoth leaders in the 400 CE is going to actually invade and sack the city of Rome. His name is Alaric. This is a devastating psychological blow. If you are a Roman living in the early 400s AD, you're looking at this once great empire, see its capital city fall to quote-unquote barbarians. It doesn't mean Rome ceases to exist. It doesn't mean like the Roman government ceases to exist. It just means it's, it's really humbled and it's unable to defend its borders. So I want to, we got a couple minutes here to wrap up. You do not need to get this down, but I, I want to pose these questions as a way of framing for you that it's a more complicated story of how and when and under what circumstances Rome fell. One could reasonably ask, did Rome fall when it ceased to be a republic? Remember, for the first couple hundred years of its existence prior to the, the, prior 
prior to Julius Caesar and slightly before him, um, it had a Senate and it shared power and, and all of those things you read about in the Venn diagram reading. When Julius Caesar and Augustus destroyed it, folks, really, I know you're not writing, but try to hold off the packing up. When Caesar and Augustus kind of dismembered that system and, and concentrated power in an emperor, did it end under Diocletian when he divided the empire into an east and west and kind of moved the focus to the east and had a new capital? Could you argue that Rome ended when the city fell in 410? Yeah, you could probably. Could you argue that when the last Roman emperor uh, died uh, or, or, or ceased to hold power in the late 400s, that's traditionally like the textbook definition, Rome fell in 476 AD because this emperor was, no, uh, was not replaced, blah, blah, blah. Could you argue that when Constantinople and the Eastern Empire fell in the 1400s, hundreds of years later, a, almost a millennia later, they will go on to, to operate and have political continuity into the 1450s. It's not until the Muslim, uh, uh, Muslim Turks, the Ottoman Empire, will conquer it. So the fall of Rome is a very complicated story. But I, I, we examine it because it forces us to think analytically about a society. What makes it work? What makes it not work? When problems exist, how are they addressed? Um, and by doing so, we're a little bit more cognizant of, of our own society. Uh, so with that, we got about a minute left. Uh, this is, of course, going to be on its learning. Uh, make sure for Monday, Venn diagrams are done. A lot of this stuff could be transferred to your Venn diagram on Rome. I think that would be a relevant addition, uh, as well as your lab activity. Hang out for another 30 seconds. <laughs>